happy to welcome all of you to the 21st lecture of the Distinguished Lecture Series organized by the Department of English, Jamia Milia Islamia. Today, we have the honor of hosting Professor David Lyon, Professor Emeritus at the Department of Sociology and Faculty of Law at Queen's University, Ontario, Canada, and the former director of the Surveillance Studies Center, who is here to deliver the talk titled, Surveillance Capitalism Meets the Pandemic, Surveillance challenges for the quote unquote social contract. We will be recording today's lecture and at the same time it's being live streamed for our audiences and subscribers on YouTube. There will be a question and answer session at the end of Professor Lyon's talk and all of you requested to kindly post your questions in the chat box, which will be then addressed to Professor Lyon. This lecture series is being organized under the guidance of a head of the department, Professor Simi Malhotra. I request her to kindly deliver the welcome address and, and introduce Professor Lyon to us. Thank you so much, uh, Suman. Uh, Professor David Lyon, our distinguished speaker this evening, and all others who have joined us from across the world, I, on behalf of the Department of English, Jamia Milia Islamia, and our collaborating partner, Department of English and American Studies, University of Woodsburg, Germany, extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this Ministry of Education Spark Supported Distinguished Lecture Series. Friends, this is the 21st lecture of our series, which is a part of the ongoing project on new terrains of consciousness, globalization, sensory environments, and local cultures of knowledge. We're indeed lucky to have with us Professor David Lyon, one of the leading intellectuals and original thinkers of our times, as our distinguished speaker this evening. It is an honor and privilege for us to host Professor Lyon, and we're all waiting to hear him speak on surveillance capitalism meets the pandemic, surveillance challenges for the social contract. I'm extremely grateful to Professor Lyon for agreeing to share his time and scholarship with us this evening. I do not have words enough to thank you with Professor Lyon. I welcome you, and now it is my honor and privilege to introduce Professor Lyon formally though he needs no introduction here whatsoever. Professor David Lyon is known the world over for his singular contribution to the field of surveillance studies. In his writings, Professor Lyon ties the intensification of surveillance to urgent concerns of ethics, social justice, civil liberties, and human rights. Professor Lyon is Professor Emeritus at the Department of Sociology and Faculty of Law at Queen's University of Ontario, Canada, and is the former director of the Surveillance Studies Center. He's author, co-author, editor, and co-editor of 32 books, and his works have been translated into 19 languages. Professor Lyon's early work explored the mutual relations of Christian social thought and the social sciences in works such as Karl Marx, A Christian Appreciation of His Life and Thought, 1979, and Sociology and the Human Image, 1983. Questions concerning the impact of modernity on religious practices finds representation in his book, The Steeple's Shadow, on the myths and realities of secularization, which was published in 1986. Whereas in Jesus in Sydney, uh, sorry, Jesus in Dis Dis Disneyland, which was published in 2000, Professor Lyon investigates the ways in which religious activities are affected by the postmodern term. His co-edited book, Rethinking Church, State and Modernity, Canada Between Europe and America, examines central concepts in the sociology and history of religion. During the 1980s, Professor Lyon began investigating how new technologies are involved in social change. Hereafter, his books such as The Silicon Society, How Will Information Technology Change Our Lives, 1986, The Information Society, Issues and Illusions, 1988, Postmodernity, 1994, The Electronic Eye, The Rise of Surveillance Society, 1994, Computer Surveillance and Privacy, 1996, Surveillance Society, Monitoring Everyday Life, 2001, Surveillance as Social Sorting, Privacy, Risk, and Digital Discrimination, 2002, Surveillance After September 11, 2003, Theorizing Surveillance, The Panopticon and Beyond, 2006, Surveillance Studies and Overview, 2007, Surveillance After Snowden, 2015, strive to address the relationship between digital modernity, processing of personal data, expanding surveillance, and diminishing human rights. Professor Lyons co-edited book with Colin Bennett, Playing the Identity Card, Surveillance, Security, and Identification in Global Perspective, published in 2008, and identified citizens, ID cards as surveillance in 2009, 
contribute to an understanding of the political economy of ideas around the world. Professor Lyons' invest investment in exploring the relation between surveillance and more recent technical and political developments can be evidence in his works such as Surveillance and Control in Israel-Palestine, Population Territory Power, which was published in 2010, Eyes Everywhere, The Global Growth of Camera Surveillance, 2011, and Transparent Lives, Surveillance in Canada in 2014. Professor Lyon is also a founding editor of the journal Surveillance in Society, an associate editor of the Information Society, and is on the editorial board of a number of other academic journals. Since the 2000s, he has led a series of team projects along with being on the international advisory boards of many other major projects on surveillance study. He is here visiting appointments in a number of universities such as Auckland, Edinburgh, Leeds, Melbourne, Sydney, Tokyo, and many others. Professor Lyon has also encouraged and inspired surveillance research initiatives and groups around the world, especially in Israel, Palestine, and the Middle East, Japan, and Latin America. Professor Lyon has been a recipient of numerous awards for his works from Canada, Switzerland, the USA, and the UK, the most recent ones being the Outstanding Contribution Award by the Surveillance Studies Network in 2018, the SSHRC Impact Insight Award in 2015, and the Molson Prize 2020. Ethics form a central node of Professor Lyon's work over all these years, which is best seen in Liquid Surveillance, the contribution of Zygmunt Bauman to Surveillance Studies, which was published in International Political Sociology in 2010, and Liquid Surveillance, which was co-authored with Zygmunt Bauman in 2013. Professor Lyon's other publications include The Culture of Surveillance 2018, and Pandemic Surveillance 2021. He's currently working on Surveillance, a very short introduction, which is to be published from Oxford University Press. Professor Lyon defines surveillance as the, and I quote, operations and experiences, uh, experiences of gathering and analyzing personal data for influence, entitlement, or management, end quote. He argues that big data practices play a central role in the post-Snowden environment, as the principal investigator of the Big Data Surveillance Project from 2015 to 2021, funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, his co-leading research, Stream One Security, the stream seeks to assess the extent and effect of big data dependent national security surveillance of communications after Edward Snowden's revelations. Their edited publication, Security, Intelligence and Surveillance in the Big Data Age, the Canadian case appeared last year from UBC Press in 2021. Professor Lyon, we are so, so honored to have you with us. I don't think this bio note does justice to your contribution to, to, the, to, the, to a whole field that you've actually inaugurated. And we are so honored to get to host you and to listen to you. And I can't thank you enough, Professor Leon. Uh, Lyon, over to you. Thank you very much for that welcome. And uh, they say that when you are about to die, sometimes you see your life go in front of your eyes. I've just seen my life go right in front of my eyes, but I don't plan to die today. But, um, I, and also I should just say, um, there, there is one thing missing from your uh, introduction. I am just an ordinary person and uh, I have uh, a partner and I have children and grandchildren and uh, they mean a huge amount to me and uh, we have a lot of fun together too. So uh, don't imagine that I'm all head and no heart. Um, there's a whole lot of heart there too. Anyway, uh, we could look at the first slide and uh, we could get going. Um, now, I wanted to, um, uh, okay, I just need to organize myself here a bit. Um, okay. Um, the thing is, I can now see the slides, but I can't see what I was uh, presenting. So let me just, there we go. Now I've got it. Um, yeah, I, I want to say some things about uh, an old idea, and I want to bring an old idea into the present in talking about the social contract. The social contract, as you probably know, is uh, is uh, an idea from uh, political philosophers from, oh, 300 years ago, if not earlier. 
And uh, I want to suggest that it might have some uh, use for us today in a particular form. And I'm suggesting that its use might be particularly um, helpful at a time when the uh, configurations of the social, the economic and the political are undergoing rapid change. Um, especially in terms of the digital and also in terms of changing political alliances and allegiances around the world. And I want to suggest that this old concept has some helpful ideas in it for us today. So that's where we're going. In particular, uh, recently, of course, I've been thinking about the pandemic and the way that so many so-called solutions to the pandemic crisis, as it was perceived in many countries, have been offered by uh, data science and a kind of data dependence belief in solutions to social and economic, uh, and in this case, health problems. But I, I want to suggest that the pandemic gave surveillance capitalism, along with willing governments, further opportunities to develop data-focused modes of addressing social and political problems. And in so doing, they frequently reduced even further both freedom and fairness in the uh, name of extraordinary emergency measures. And I think this is certainly true of India's pandemic response, especially the use of the Aadhaar system to enable COVID responses such as contactless vaccine delivery using Aadhaar's um, facial recognition technology. Um, I've spent a bit of time in India and uh, have some wonderful colleagues in uh, your country, and uh, I have depended on uh, them for helping me to understand the situation in India insofar as I do. The conjunction then of um, the pandemic and surveillance capitalism strengthened and continues to strengthen public-private partnerships and simultaneously highlights the need I would argue, for a contemporary reset of any notion of a social contract, insofar as that idea has salience for uh, what we might call data democracy. Increasingly, it seems to me, government and business partnerships on the one hand, and digitally disempowered citizens and consumers on the other, struggle to recognize each other let alone to develop a meaningful modus vivendi for a democratic, global, and planetary future. So what I want to say has two main parts. The first is on the challenges of data democracy that are presented by this meeting, as I'm calling it, of uh, pand the pandemic and surveillance capitalism. The evolving relationships between platform and pandemic raise more issues than familiar function creep practices where uh, something that is set up for, for one purpose ends up being used for another, such as I already mentioned, RDR being used for uh, pandemic uh, purposes. Platforms are entering many more spheres today with new consequences. And I think especially of the uh, Google, Apple exposure notification uh, API, which enabled the production of contact tracing apps around the world. This was used in many countries and hugely bolstered the position of these tech giants in the public health domain. And these offer a, a key example of expanding what I would call infrastructural surveillance power. That is to say, surveillance power that is built into the systems with which we uh, interact every day. Specific surveillance technologies are also gaining traction despite the evidence of their limited usefulness, their well-known threats to privacy, and their debatable levels of success. 
uh, Mark Andreevich and uh, Nick Sel Selwyn say of facial recognition technologies, and I think this applies uh, more widely, they say the experience of the past couple of decades has been shaped by the widespread implementation of increasingly comprehensive and granular forms of monitoring in exchange for the convenience and affordances of various data-driven technologies, end quote. That's in a new book by them coming out later this year on facial recognition technology. The language of trade-off and bargains features frequently in such debates. And that's why I think that the notion of so social contract might be germane to our particular moment in history. So the second part of my argument then will be about the prospects for the relatively recent revival, and I think there is a bit of a revival of the notion of social contract. Um, and I want to uh, look at the issues raised by big data surveillance, algorithmic analysis, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on. That early modern notion of a social contract revived by John Rawls, for example, in the 1970s, now has new life in the hands of a number of current observers. And I'm going to mention a couple of those as we go along. If we could have the next slide. So let me just give one example of vaccine passports as surveillance. Now, vaccine passports issued around the world as the pandemic was met by, met by widespread vaccination in wealthier countries first and then uh, others later, are but one example of what I think of as pandemic surveillance. They exemplify the issues that not just matters of privacy, but also of data justice become apparent. And again, I'll say more about data justice as we go along. Uh, for example, in Quebec, the first Canadian province to approve uh, vaccine passports, uh, there was immediate controversy with their introduction, as in many other places. Uh, bar owners complained that instead of greeting patrons, they have to interrogate them. Uh, an issue erupted in the uh, Assemblée Nationale over whether the uh, député, as they're called in uh, Quebec, had to show their passports. Were they essential workers as those who were representing, uh, as politicians representing their constituencies? Meanwhile, the uh, Ligue des Trois et Libertés, the uh, League of uh, Law, uh, Rights and Liberties, worried about data security and the possibility that the passport could be used for other monitoring purposes. Not for the first time during the pandemic then, the spectre of surveillance surfaced, this time with vaccine passports. Pressure to roll them out came from travel and hospitality companies, especially anxious for a return to business as usual. And newscasts boast constantly of their success in reducing COVID-19 uh, infection rates. But amid the various arguments about such passports, a further conversation was largely absent. That is, about the surging surveillance enabled by yet another pandemic innovation. Now, of course, the pull of back to normal was understandably strong after nearly two years of tragic death rates, anxieties over family and personal health, constant lockdowns and other restrictions. But the calls for a just recovery have often fallen on deaf ears, especially with respect to the massive uptick in monitoring and surveillance that puts those following 9-11 or in uh, India's case in 2008 in Mumbai in the shade. Those proposing a just recovery demand that the uneven impacts of the pandemic, especially along the lines of race, class, and gender, be addressed in ways that are manifestly fair. So what's the connection between surveillance and injustice? Isn't privacy the core issue? Well, privacy is challenged in new ways. 
perhaps above all in the domestic concept, context, that is targeted in unprecedented fashion during the pandemic's oft-repeated stay home, stay safe mantra. But the privacy questions are not identical for all. If you work remotely, there's a vast difference between the experience of the comfortable white collar professionals on the one hand and precarious gig, gig workers on the other, for example. Also, the stay home rule increased the burden on women around the world, including their often unwelcome exposure on screen to others while working, shopping or learning online. As in other areas, pandemic surveillance is both experienced more profoundly among those already disadvantaged, and it often serves to retrench rather than rectify such disadvantages. It's certainly true for indigenous people in North America who suffer from both insufficient surveillance, their condition frequently lacks adu adequate data, and slanted surveillance, mistaken assumptions being made by health authorities about their pandemic knowledge and practices. And the vaccine passports are indelibly surveillant. They rely on government held personal health data that citizens are then obliged to display for travel and social participation. They make their holders visible to airlines, restaurants, sporting events, whatever representing them as responsible citizens and permitting movement or access to those holding the vaccine passports. Now, as it happens, there are many valid reasons why someone might not hold a vaccine passport. They may be immunochallenged, for instance, or fear that the warning labels on the vaccines about the possibilities of, say, heart inflammation may affect them as seniors, with a history of cardiac problems. They may also have read the small print on vaccine limits or side effects and decided to wait for improved options. But those choices carry consequences, as well as being refused boarding at an airport or being served in a bar, hot, uh, holders may be scapegoated. They may fill a new role as an excludable risky other. A new slide, please. In fact, many kinds of surveillance introduced for the pandemic could also be here to stay. But are they now being questioned as possibilities for a post-pandemic future start to emerge? By the way, the word post-pandemic is a bit misleading. We don't mean that the COVID is going to go away. We do mean that it is possible that it might be controlled over the next few years. So don't get me wrong, I'm offering no good news on that front. Not so much, but red lights began to flash almost as soon as COVID-19 was identified, when a raft of new surveillance techniques from digital contact tracing onwards were hastily rolled out, courtesy of overeager tech companies and underprepared public health authorities. And I'm afraid that is something that is true the world over uh, and just variations in, the, in how consequential it was, but it happened everywhere. Big data solutions were front and center, offering the modeling behind the now familiar dashboards uh, of pandemic progress and the means to remotely track and trace potentially infected people. Of course, there is value in these initiatives. Some have been credited with saving lives or preventing uh, intensive care units from being overwhelmed. But in Canada, most Canadians never used the, uh, what was in our case called the COVID-19 alert app partly because of privacy concerns uh, and uh, accessibility and inclusion challenges that uh, affected vulnerable populations such as seniors. But at the same time, the pandemic prompted massive surveillance expansion in other areas of social life, especially via the stay home, stay safe mantra. Working, learning, shopping and being entertained at home also entail an explosion of domestic surveillance. 
through platforms such as Protoscore for monitoring employee performance remotely. Zoom for myriad online conferencing purposes, which may well be you know, used for great purposes like today. Examity for remote proctoring of tests and examinations or invigilation, maybe you call it in uh, Indian English, I can't remember. Um, Amazon for universal shopping, plus music and movie providers and so on to compensate for the erosion of public entertainment and of public life in general. Tech companies pivoted from their previous primary activity to others, not only in public health, but also to other pandemic related areas, including policing. Every platform that repurposed itself for the pandemic is highly surveillant. So you see what I'm doing? I'm putting together those health care related forms of surveillance that you might naturally think of as pandemic surveillance, along with the surveillance explosion in uh, that targets the domestic space, as I say, through uh, our activities at home, for those who uh, have access to such uh, facilities, for those who have access to uh, working from home, uh, conferencing from home, uh, learning from home, shopping from home, being entertained at home, and so on. Every one of those platforms is highly surveillant. New slide, please. In each case, whether in public health or stay home initiatives, surveillance capitalism and tech companies in general are also implicated, especially through public private partnerships between government departments and platforms. Very true of India. Indeed, some speak of an epidemiological turn in digital surveillance with two dimensions. On the one hand, function creep, that is when you start uh, with one particular uh, function of a technology, and then somebody realizes, oh, it could be used somewhere else as well, and you move it over to that area. That's the idea of function creep. And on the ha other hand, market making. In other words, entrepreneurs realizing that there's a possible new market uh, available courtesy of the pandemic. On the one hand, already existing systems have been upgraded or repurposed for the COVID situation sometimes developed by mobile network operators for low to middle income countries for over, uh, over recent decades. And on the other, software developers launched mobile apps to support contact tracing, often based on that Google Apple API. Such developers believe that they too can benefit from the use of the apps. For example, Google has been seeking greater means of access to health data for many years, which is, again, where surveillance capitalism becomes evident. And by the way, uh, if I slide over some of these things in uh, my little book on pandemic surveillance, I take some of these ideas further. Now, Zuboff's argument, Shoshana Zuboff, argues that surveillance capitalism bears a strong resemblance to B.F. Skinner's Walden II, which is a behaviorist dystopia, where technology drives decision making and compensates for the deficiencies of human decision making, free will and autonomy. This system uses data to predict outcomes and to produce addiction among users that together offer unprecedented opportunities for platform companies to manipulate and exploit the inner lives of their users. And when I say predict outcomes, that's something that you are familiar with, I imagine. But to produce addiction, uh, let me just mention that one of the largest um, uh, neuroscience labs in the world is the one owned by Facebook in New York. And that corporation, of course, among others, is in the business of producing addiction among users. As Kirsty Ball pointed out in her review of Zuboff's book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, Zuboff also makes use of the language of securitization, often referring to <clears throat> states of exception and rendition visible in the acti activities of surveillance capitalism today. The suspension of normal 
democratic rules, the exception, and the use of coercion, rendition, have been debated well uh, by philosophers like uh, Giorgio Agamben and others, <clears throat> especially since uh, the beginning of this century. Curiously, these military security metaphors for the war against terrorism were revived during the COVID-19 pandemic, aided by the same capitalist, uh, surveillance capitalist platforms, not to mention actual deployment of military personnel and technology in this so-called struggle. Zuboff has also written about the role of the pandemic in boosting surveillance capitalism in terms consistent, I think, with what I'm thinking of as a social contract reset. And she says this, the United States and the world's other liberal democracies have thus far failed to construct a coherent political vision of a digital century that advances democratic values, principle, and government. She then contrasts that with China, which um, I, I think can be done, but um, it's the reference to liberal democracies that is important here. The Chinese case is a, is a very interesting one, and uh, I'm not going to speak about that today, but I do think that, it, that we need to take care in simply contrasting so-called liberal democracies with so-called uh, authoritarian rule, because in some ways they're becoming more similar. Uh, a new slide. So let us let me talk now a, a little bit about the idea of a, a reset of the uh, old idea of a social contract. It's been suggested by, for example, Tony Weller, uh, that uh, late 20th century surveillance developments based on information, the language was more about information at the end of the 20th century than data, which is where we are today. These were met with updates to the social contract. And today an increasing number of voices argue implicitly or explicitly, that social contracts should once again be revamped due to the rapid growth of data analytics and the rise of surveillance capitalism. No doubt many will ask, what will it take, given the vast new surveillance powers that have been unleashed since social media, platform infrastructures, and especially surveillance capitalism emerged? An implicit example comes from Jose van Dyck, and she says this, as Snowden's documents made clear, that's Edward Snowden reporting on the uh, ways in which the National Security Authority in the US was uh, actually surveilling American citizens. As Snowden's documents made clear, people have faith in the institutions that handle their metadata on the presumption that they comply with the rules set by publicly accountable agents. Now, there's an, uh, a, a phrase that has resonance with social contract ideas. OK, I'll, I'll give it to you again. People have faith in the institutions that handle their data on the presumption that they comply with the rules set by publicly accountable agents. So you get the idea of a contract there. Uh, it's possible for citizens, consumers to have faith in the institutions that handle their data presuming that they comply with rules set by public, publicly accountable agents. There's the idea of a, a contract. It's time to take a critical look at some contributions to the surveillance and social contract debates, looking especially at their treatment of the civil society dimension of the social contract on the one hand, and the demand for government to take strong and principled roles in holding tech giants to account on the other. As I say, this is an old idea. Social contract is derived from early modern thinkers such as Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, and it's been adapted with social, economic, and political change for the past 300 years. Notably, security, protection, and welfare gradually offered by governments in the 20th century, particularly, in return for the loss of sovereignty among citizens has increasingly revolved around issues of information and now data. In everything from conscription rated, uh, related data for the call up of soldiers for war to the data amassed for uh, public welfare provision 
the social contract has been under question and sometimes gradually, uh, sometimes painfully revised. Now, in relation to our area that of new technologies used for surveillance, historians such as James Benninger, for example, observe that bureaucratic monitoring arose in relation to industrialization using new technologies at the time, typewriters, telephones, cameras, and so on, in order to govern citizens in ways analogous to the way that things might be governed in emerging industrial processes. And, and that is one of the ways that uh, Benninger talks about the process. Although this is less frequently noted, the monitoring of consumers as well as workers using new technologies also expanded from the later 19th century. This process intensified during the 20th century as both warfare and welfare uh, grew with the rise of state security intelligence, the welfare state, not to mention later 20th century growth of targeted advertising to consumers, all of which required uh, I have that word in quote marks, required increasing amounts of personal data that were processed in increasingly arcane ways, ways that couldn't be understood by those who were under surveillance. So what Tony Weller suggests, she says that today's variant on the classic social contract uh, states something like this, citizens accept surveillance in order to ensure that they are entitled to welfare and protected from threat as long as the means of such surveillance are transparent and accountable. However, Weller was writing between the attacks on New York and Washington in 9-11 uh, and the revelations about the National Security Agency surveillance leaked by Edward Snowden in the first decade of the uh, social media. The stakes have been raised hugely in subsequent years with the development of monopolistic platform companies, sometimes referred to as platform capitalism, that operate by establishing hardware and software systems that are actually used by other companies building on the platform. So platform companies supply the digital infrastructure such for others, such as Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Uber, Airbnb, and uh, all the others. Controversies about how far this new variant is really working have become more and more strident in the 21st century. In North America, especially after 9-11, and then increasingly worldwide with the rise of social media, seen sharply in the Cambridge Analytica Facebook debacle, uh, the Snowden revelations in 2013, and today in the COVID-19 pandemic. All too frequently, so far from actively consenting to surveillance, citizens and consumers are simply unaware that they are under surveillance, uh, which may, one might have to modify that phrase, unaware of the kinds of surveillance that are going on, concerned maybe about some specific thing that they might have inadvertently said, or a photo that might inadvertently have effects that they hadn't thought of when they posted them originally. Those are the kind of personal uh, fears that people have about surveillance. But I'm talking about the kind of surveillance that doesn't affect us so much as individuals, but as we are members of groups because all the surveillance that I've been talking about divides the population into categories. And it's as a member of a category that we are under surveillance. And uh, the old kinds of surveillance that are done by police and security agencies and so on, of course, that still exists. But it's this new kind of surveillance that is so uh, subtle and so consequential for millions of lives <clears throat> every day. And at the same time, of course, questions of government or corporate transparency can easily be used to deflect attention from the deeper and much more important questions of accountability. So a uh, new slide, please, on debating surveillance. Several insightful and thoughtful contributions have been made in recent years that apply ideas and practices of social contract to the growth of surveillance. 
These apply both to state surveillance and especially to national security surveillance and to consumer surveillance in the era of surveillance capitalism. <clears throat> uh, and by the way, I've been using the term surveillance capitalism. Maybe I should just say a word about what I mean by surveillance capital capitalism. I mean, basically the, the monetization and the profiting from everyday personal data that is uh, sucked up by every platform and uh, frequently used not only by the platforms, but data that can be bought by uh, government departments for their use in different ways. So uh, it's very much a capitalist uh, practice and very much based on uh, data that is available through, uh, well, social media in the first place, but just about every platform today. So uh, maybe I should have defined that a little bit before. But none as yet uh, of these uh, efforts to look at social contract for today speaks to the conjunction of these two, um, as revealed in the pandemic, where techniques and technologies from consumer surveillance are used in the service of government mandates, such as mask wearing, quarantine observance, contact tracing, physical location monitoring, and so on. And so I've been looking at a range of uh, writers who have been producing interesting pieces recently that uh, suggest that the social contract might be a good way of thinking about this. For example, um, Robert Polito, uh, an American author, has uh, argued for a new social contract under the uh, book title Bargaining with the Machine. And he's concerned about privacy questions, but also for justice questions, given the inequalities associated with and exacerbated by current surveillance trends. He was, of course, writing pre-pandemic. His book came out in 2020. It's about how people negotiate trade-offs in the face of what he calls growing structural impediments to any semblance of free choices in this context. So Polito is one. And uh, I've, I, I've reviewed the work of a number of other people writing in the same area, but I want to mention two that are particularly significant, because as I look at the world of surveillance capitalism and pandemic surveillance, uh, I realize that there are some areas that are more critical than others for getting a grasp on what is really going on. And uh, those two are on the one hand, data science uh, that grew out of computing science um, that has to do with uh, the development of algorithms and moves through to machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. And on the other hand, business studies, which has become the staple of many, uh, well, academic areas and uh, has actually been quite influential in the way that some universities have developed for better or worse. And so I think if we can find people who are writing about social contract in relation to data science and to business studies, then there's a possibility that we might be able to get to the core of the issues of trying to find democratic ways of organizing uh, digital society. So one of them uh, I'll, I'll mention, uh, Ayad Rahwan, uh, speaks from within the domain, as I say, of data analysis, arguing for what he calls an algorithmic social contract. And uh, his view is to ensure that artificial intelligence, AI, is fair and accountable. And uh, within artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning, uh, they talk frequently about whether or not you have a human in the loop. So human in the loop, the idea that However, you try to make an autonomous system, uh, you need to ask the question, well, is there a human in the loop at some point within the process within which that is being developed? And uh, he argues strongly for the need for humans in the loop practices. And in fact, he wants to extend it to what he calls society in the loop as a means of negotiating the values of those who would be involved uh, in or affected by the system in question. 
And this would, in his view, enable human and societal supervision of AI, for instance, in developing smart highways, and thus, thus as he puts it, uh, taming the techno leviathan. That uh, sounds pretty optimistic to me, but uh, the basics, basics of his argument seem to me to be sound ones. And certainly, I think that the notion of humans in the loop and society in the loop uh, are crucial for an area that frequently acts as if it was, as it were, autonomous and subject only to its own rules of practice. And then within business studies, uh, an interesting article by Kirsten Martin offers some telling insights on how the terms of the data-oriented social contract must shift from obtaining the consent of the user, consumer, or employee to the responsibilities of the firm for, uh, as a contractor to, as she puts it, maintain a mutually beneficial and sustainable solution. Now, anyone who knows anything about businesses today will know that uh, they are all wanting our consent. We are expected to fill those little uh, terms of reference, check those little terms of ref uh, reference or the um, privacy policy of whatever it is that we're trying to get into. And for many people, they are a nuisance in two senses. One, you can't get into the uh, whatever it is you're trying to see until you've checked the box. But two, if you do check the box, it's in impenetrable prose. So you can't even understand what it is you'd be expected to sign on to if you did do it. So that question of shifting the focus from ob obtaining the consent of the user, the consumer or the employee to the responsibilities of the firm as a contractor to maintain a mutually beneficial and sustainable solution seems to me to be a very good one and one that would uh, certainly relieve many consumers and users of the awkwardness that surrounds those terms of uh, use. Uh, Kristen Martin, she, she builds on Helen Nissenbaum's work, which uh, I have a lot of respect for, and she argues that users should be able discriminately to share information within situations of contextual privacy. Facebook, Verizon, or whoever should give their users the right to know who has access to their data and how it is used. People should have a space for freedom of movement, access to data, and how it's used within that relationship. Expecting users to read and understand privacy policies must stop. The social contract makes for relationship and what she calls strong community. So you see what I'm saying? There, there are people writing in this field that, uh, whose ideas I find quite attractive and very relevant to uh, our everyday lives and uh, to the situations that we find ourselves in. So there is an ap apparently a rising interest in notions of how social contract might be applied to the world of data analytics, mon monopolistic platforms, and surveillance capitalism. So last slide. Uh, I'll try to move quickly. I see the time is uh, going faster than I'd imagined. Given that social contract theory covers a multitude of possibilities, let me comment briefly on some advantages of using the concept, and I'll suggest three. Um, one is that some, pe some people might claim, well, the old classical notion of social contract uh, is pretty individualistic. But I would argue that this isn't a necessary aspect at all. Understanding how culturally consumers and users relate to the digital openings with civil society are clearly present as a feature, for example, in the very groups enabled by social media and many platforms, groups of which you and I may well be members. Secondly, a social contract suited to today's digital society where surveillance capitalism is prominent is a uh, obliged to consider a three-way relationship. We can't just talk about citizen and state. We have to talk about civil society. We have to talk about the state and the corporation. And so uh, we have to acknowledge the situation that affects us in so many countries that state and corporation are working very closely together. There cannot be democracy without uh, involvement of all three rather than as it were two 
parties. So we have to negotiate appropriate policy. Um, and the quality of relationships that are vital in the social contract has to go, uh, can't ultimately depend on mere legal and calculative measures. I see there is one other slide. I'm just going to go quickly through that and uh, we'll be done. So I've argued in for some time that ways forward for digital citizenship have to be based on the way that ordinary internet users may show themselves to be more than the things that Benninger argued was how they began to be treated in the 20th century. There is a looping effect. When people are under surveillance, they come to know that they are under surveillance and they change their behavior as a result of it. And getting that sense that we are under surveillance in ways that are new and different from how we were under surveillance before is critically important. But the looping means that uh, we might be treated like things, but we are not going to be reduced to things. And that, I think, is a, a crack that lets in the light. It uh, emerges and may well emerge more as a democratic opportunity. OK, I think I'm going to uh, close there because I did want to leave a little bit of time. Uh, so I've been arguing that there may be a, a possibility and offering to you the chance for discussion over whether there's a possibility for restoring some notion of a social contract that would suit the particular exigencies of our day in the early 21st century, where we are entering digital societies that may well have many benefits for humanity, but the way things that are current, the way that they're currently organized under surveillance capitalism uh, means increasingly that the chances for democracy as it was once understood are being reduced. And therefore, I would argue, we need to be thinking of new ways of uh, digital expression for democratic activities based around uh, a new social contract, which I don't believe has been developed yet, but I think um, that it has great possibilities. And I've tried to suggest to you today how some of those possibilities might be worth uh, thinking about, taking further, raising within areas where we have uh, access and attempting to move forward towards some kind of a, a new social contract for digital democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Lyon, for that absolutely fantastic lecture. I think you raised such important points about concerns that we all have had about not just surveillance capitalism, but what you absolutely rightly defi defined as platform capitalism and the way the state and the corporate machinery has been coming together and managing our data uh, and treating us as data in some senses and the consequences that it has on our on our everyday lives in some senses. But I think uh, the optimistic tone with which you you know which you've offered us ways of thinking through this particular. Uh, domain of uh, possibly thinking of a reset of social contract is one way of certainly uh, making uh, making a space for more freedoms and more uh, more human rights and more uh, more democratic rights, which can be possible. And I think uh, the the argument that you made about being able to bargain uh, through, with the machines, you know, whether it's artificial intelligence or machine learning or whether it's big data or algorithms, uh, you know, through looping in the human or looping in uh, in even the whole idea of, 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 of the social or the social contract itself uh, can certainly be a way of democratizing the space which is essentially uh, so heavily uh, undemocratic as it exists now and you absolutely signposted the very, very dangerous, you know, uh, implications of us not being able to do that reset and we've seen that, you know, in in how you've signposted and talked about Cambridge Analytica and about you know ways in which and the implication that it has for all our uh, all our lives in that sense. So uh, very very thankful to you, Professor Lyon. Uh, good evening, everyone. It has been an intellectually rich evening indeed. And on behalf of the Department of English and the organizing team, I would like to thank everyone who made today's event successful. First and foremost, a huge thank you to our prof speaker, Professor Lyon who has given us so much to think with and think through. His talk will no doubt 
be reverberating with us for a long time to come. Thank you, Professor Lyon, for lending us so much of your time and for sharing your insights with us. We are indeed grateful to you. As always, I would like to thank our HOD Professor Simi Malhotra. Also, thank you to Shraddha, Zaira, Suman, Sakshi, Susan, and everyone on the organizing team who are responsible for running our event so smoothly. And thank you to our audience, everyone who tuned in today from all sorts of time zones and places. Thank you all so much, friends, and we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you so much, Professor Lyon. We're so grateful. Thank you so much for all your time and for sharing your work with us. We're really grateful. Well, I've, I've really enjoyed it. The only thing that would have made it better would be if I was actually with you in person. Rather I, hope than that'll, I hope that'll happen sometime. Through soon. a screen. But yes. uh, yeah, I am very happy to be here. And thank you so much for your kind invitation and your kind comments. Thank you so much, Professor Lyon. We're so grateful. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Bye now.